In the third video, we're going to talk through solution techniques uh, and outcomes from that solution process. So by solution techniques, I mean, let's take a minute to understand when we're solving an LP, what's actually happening behind the scenes, even if we're not the ones doing the actual solving. And of course, there are commercial solvers out there that do a really good job of this, so we don't have to worry about it. Um, but it, it helps us understand what's happening, what the solver is trying to accomplish so that we can do a better job of formulating the problems to begin with. So let's revisit our simple problem that we have from before. Again, we have three constraints here. Um, in this uh, example, now I've drawn the direction of the constraint. So the inequality that we've written for each equation uh, or for each uh, expression is indicated by the directions of the arrows. Um, so we're again trying to maximize our objective function z, uh, and what we want to do is uh, find a way to come to the optimal solution, which graphically we see um, is in indicated by this, this point on the top. So there's a couple things that we need to note about this problem. Um, the first thing is that this problem is convex. Right? You'll hear this word show up quite a bit, uh, this idea of, of convexity. So what convexity actually means is that if I were to pick two arbitrary points within this shape, right, I, I pick a point over here and a point over here, and I draw a line between those two points, it, that line does not cross the boundary of the uh, region that's defined here. So if you look at this shape, that is true no matter which two points we pick. Um, obviously, if you had some you know, protrusion coming in here that was uh, sort of interrupting this shape and you picked a point and a point, uh, that protrusion would interrupt that and that is not a convex shape then. Um, so that's fine. So that's uh, a convex system or convex system of equations. One thing to note is if you are using a linear system of equations, this uh, geometry is always going to be convex, right? There's no way of writing inequalities that result in a, in a non-convex shape. So as long as you formulate the problem correctly, it should be convex. Um, we're going to take advantage of that convexity when we actually solve the problem, because we know that um, if we choose a solution um, and we're maximizing our objective function, that solution is going to have to be, first of all, on an extreme uh, line that is this line here corresponds to the furthest possible extent you can go while still being feasible, right? Same for this line. So there's these extreme lines or extreme um, uh, bounds of the problem. And then a point at which these two extreme lines intersect is called an extreme point. So, so here we have an extreme point. Uh, and we also have an extreme point here. The solution, by naturally maximizing or, or minimizing the function, is going to want to go to these extreme points. That's just the, the way it works. So in effect, when we're saying, I'm going to maximize some objective z, I'm saying, I'm going to find the best possible extreme point in the set of all extreme points. Right? And you can go through proofs that, that actually lay that out. But the bottom line is that we're essentially solving for all the extreme point objective function values and determining which of them is the best. The key to this process is that because the system is convex, we can traverse from one extreme point to the next um, through a, a systematic process and find the uh, optimal value and know when we found the optimal value. The second thing to note here is that this system as drawn has a feasible region. Uh, there are points within this uh, bounded region where all the constraints are satisfied. That's indica indicated by the gray shading. Right? So we have uh, two, we have a feasible region. Uh, obviously, if you're trying to optimize or solve a problem, um, you're going to need for some region of that problem to be feasible. But it's not always clear where that region is relative to the constraints. Um, and it's not always clear where you can go to start is in a feasible solution position. So this algorithms all work by uh, relying on the fact that there's convexity 
and by trying to first identify a feasible region and then work within that. So let's talk a little bit about the algorithm uh, that is most commonly used to solve linear problems. Okay, so that's called the simplex method. All right, so the simplex method is a system of solving for these extreme points and then determining uh, which direction should, should be uh, used to move next. Um, I'm not going to go through a lot of detail on this because it's sort of outside of the scope of a brief tutorial, um, but let's just really quickly go over the basics so we understand what's happening. So the simplex method works um, by first choosing uh, what's called a basis. Right, so a basis is going to be essentially a set of constraints um, that we will solve simultaneously to find the solution for the extreme points. So in this case we have right x2 and x1 so our dimensionality is n equals 2 for this problem. The basis consists of two then so n equals 2 uh, constraints and we can pick any of the two out of three constraints we want and solve. Right? So we first choose the basis then we uh, solve for the uh, extreme point. And this is going to be done using any conventional matrix inversion technique because if you think about it, we actually have, right, so if n equals 2, that means our matrix is going to be right, a11, a12, a21, a22, uh, x1, x2 is equal to b1, B2, right? We can solve that system of equations for an exact single solution, a unique solution. So once we have the solution to our extreme point, right, we calculate z at our, uh, our first basis. Uh, we're going to hold on to that value and then figure out where to go next. Right? One important thing to note, though, is that when you solve this uh, using the simplex method and, and just through matrix inversion, what you're actually doing is uh, solving for a distance that that remaining constraint is from, uh, from that uh, extreme point. So in this example, we had uh, chosen, say, this was 1, this was 2. Uh, let's say we then left three constraint 3 out of the basis. So for solving this problem, we actually can introduce this, what we call a slack variable. And that slack variable indicates the distance that the solution is offset from that constraint. Right? It's kind of the shortest path length from that constraint to the solution. And we'll note the sign of this variable. So we can call this S3. If S3 is positive, then that means that, uh, that the solution that we have is in the feasible region of our remaining, you know, our third constraint. If it's negative, then that means that the extreme point is not in the feasible region. So what might th that example look like? So again, we have our three constraints, but now let's say that instead of choosing one and two for the basis, I had chosen uh, two and three, right? So three and two form the basis. If I solve that uh, system of two equations and two unknowns, my solution is right here at this intersection point. Okay, if I have a slack variable then, right, my slack variable for one is defined to be positive in the direction of the, of the constraint, then that means the actual slack variable value is gonna be negative, right? Here it's, um, it's negative in this case because it's the opposite direction of the con that the constraint is defined. So that is an indication the negativity of the remaining constraint or remaining constraints uh, indicates that the, the solution point that I found for the combination of two and three is an infeasible point. All right, so if I go through this, uh, add, the, add two and three to the, base, to the basis, solve it, get back any of the constraints being negative, uh, those slack variables being negative for those constraints, that means that that's an infeasible point and I have to discard it and move, uh, move on to some other, uh, some other point. So the procedure here for the simplex method is, you know, choose the basis, solve for the extreme point, three, check the sign 
of the uh, slack variables uh, for non-basis constraints. Okay, and if it's if it's a negative uh, slack variable value, then we treat that as infeasible and move on. So assuming that we have uh, started this process, we chose, let's say, let's take now our example to be three and one in our basis. We found this solution uh, from the inversion of the ba uh, basis matrix. The next step is, this is a feasible, feasible point, right? The slack variable for two is positive. So the next step is we need to figure out which direction to move. Uh, where do we go next to test our optimality? Um, so we can look uh, with there are certain properties of the solution that give us an indication of how z, or the cost function, is varying in each direction from the basis along these, these what we call extreme rays, or these uh, extreme lines. And so based on that, uh, that cost function that we get back, and again, I won't go into the detail there, but we get back a cost function and the algorithm says, all right, my best bet is to move in this direction. I'm gonna see an increase in Z in this direction. So it moves on to the next uh, point and solves for the, uh, the basis according to one and two. Uh, you know, so step four is going to be move uh, to new basis. Right, so then after moving to this basis of one and two, and we solve that equation, we get back uh, some results that indicate that um, no matter which way you go, right, if we were to go this way, uh, let's get rid of this, if we were to go this way along constraint two, or if we were to go this way along constraint one, that the, the cost function is indicating to us that there's no possible gain to be had in Z. And so just by solving that and, and uh, solving that system of equations and keeping track of the costs along the way, the sim simplex algorithm is able to determine that this is our optimal point, right? There's no possible way that you can move that's gonna in improve the objective. And furthermore, because it's a convex problem, there's no other way for, uh, for the objective function to improve outside of that local region, right? So by figuring out that locally there's no way to improve Z, because of the convexity of the problem, it guarantees us that we found a global solution.